Our next uh, speaker is uh, Mitch Ripley, and he's going to talk about HR issues. And uh, Mitch was a county commissioner in, in Johnson County, and I actually met Mitch's brother. Mitch's brother was a commissioner in Adams County um, be, before I ever uh, met Mitch. And um, um, so not too often you have brothers who are commissioners in two separate counties, but that happened here. Um, Mitch is a is a, a great resource. Um, he's a graduate of Ball State University, um, also Anderson University, and has a law degree that focuses on uh, HR issues. And so, um, really appreciate again him coming out on a uh, on a Saturday morning. And um, I'll turn this over to Mitch. You should have his hand out. And as he's coming up, I'll uh, start the PowerPoint uh, program here. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, to give you a little, I have been doing human resources now since uh, back at the turn of the century. Um, so I've been working with cities and towns and counties since about 1987. So I know a little bit about what's going on in each of your areas. Uh, having been a county commissioner too, it uh, makes it a little more that I know what does and what doesn't happen in counties and considering mine was Johnson, which is now far from here, if we weren't doing it, what we're finding is others aren't doing it as well. So this morning when, when I was asked to talk, with, I was doing this uh, seminar for a group of um, administrative assistants to the mayors uh, in Indiana. And what we found out when we started thinking about it we realize that you all have the same issues that many of our cities and towns. We either have an HR person or in most cases we don't. Um, so one of the things that I'm going to strongly recommend to you today is either find an HR person or find a service or something because with the changes that we have seen just in the last three to four years in my world of HR law, um, it'll make your head spin. Uh, let me ask you, I want to start off real quick. How many of you in here provide your retirees with health insurance? Okay. The ones that didn't raise your hand, do you know that there is an Indiana state statute that requires you to offer them your health care package when they retire. If they qualify for PERF and the 20 year and the whole package, we, there is a small obscure state statute that literally it's not in my program because we just found this out after being at a session myself. But there is a small little statute that states that every municipal entity, if you provide a health and care package for your employees, you also have to offer that same package to your retirees that meet the criteria. The beauty is you don't have to pay for it. <laughs> I thought I'd save that for you. <laughs> you don't have to pay for it, but you still have to offer it. And I work with about 100 cities and towns in the state and several counties, and, I, and even as Johnson County Commissioner, we provide a health care package for employees. Didn't even know this existed until it was brought to my attention. And then we did the research. And sure enough, you are required to do it. So I don't want to scare anybody, but it is something you at least have to put out there to offer to your employees to pay for. Um, one of the things, in most counties, and, and I'm not used to being trapped behind a podium. <laughs> also, being a preacher, you don't <laughs> stand behind a podium. Um, you need to determine in most counties that do not have HR, of course, we know it's your auditor. That's who's stuck with the record keeping. That's who's stuck with doing all the paperwork. But you need to, to help as far as councils are concerned, and I'm glad I get to speak to you. I got to speak to the county commissioners back in December. But what I'm really, and what I found out even as county commissioner, 
is you guys kind of actually can drive the boat if you know how to do it. And it's up to you in my book to, to help push in your counties for more than just the auditor because not that they're not capable, but they have enough to do that you want to turn that responsibility over to somebody else. Ultimately, it is a responsibility of the county commissioners to make sure it's covered, but you guys have to fund it. You guys have to help provide all the things that guys like me need in a job. Why worry about it? Simply because there's so much happening, i.e. this insurance package, that you're not aware of, that I wasn't aware of. One of the things that I want to talk about, how many of you in here already have employee manuals? Okay, so a portion of you, if you don't have an employee manual, what I would recommend is you get one, that you provide one, State Board of Accounts um, has just recently, within the last three to four years, started taking your policy and procedure manual and during their audits then they look at it and then compare to see what you're really doing with your employees are your time uh, your overtime how is it done um, how's your are your um, different programs that they're responsible for looking at mostly time and and overtime and do you do comp time which in, in our world, we get to do comp time, where I came from uh, as HR, head of HR for American Transair. We didn't get to do comp time because it's not legal. But the question is, are you following your manual? And that is what State Board of Accounts is going through many of the municipal cities and towns that I work with right now and asking and looking at those books. So if you don't have it and you don't have it up to date, you need to get there. Um, some things that you may not know that's really important today, your employees in your counties, if they're injured, there is a 72 hour rule by OSHA and by uh, workers comp that they turn in a workers comp injury form within that 72 hour window. Especially if there's medical insurance and if there's medical involved, they need to make sure that that's turned in. Because let me give you a, a real hi history in case you didn't know. An employee in a large city in northern Indiana scraped his knuckles on the back of a garbage truck. Didn't think anything about it. Two weeks later, he happened to be in the mayor's office and his knuckle was the size of a quarter. It had swollen that much and the mayor asked him, what did you do? And he said, oh, I scraped it on the garbage truck. And not thinking, she immediately said, oh, this is workers comp, you need to go to the hospital and get it taken care of. After they went to the hospital, when it turns around, he didn't file his first report of injury. Because he didn't file his first report of injury, the workers' comp carrier, per, o per the omnibudsman here in the state of Indiana, because I don't know if you're aware, but we have an OSHA omnibudsman that controls workers' comp. And that omnibudsman has put out that if you're not meeting the 72-hour window, they're supposed to be starting to deny them. Now, it's okay, because we all have health insurance, right? Unless you happen to know that there's a federal statute that if you've ever been to the hospital, one of the first two questions they ask you was, did this happen at home, or did this happen at work? The moment you, that you tell them it happened at work, the federal statute says you cannot go back and claim medical, claim it on your medical insurance. The gentleman came back to the mayor of this city. I have a $6,000 bill. I got a phone call, Mitch, what are we supposed to do? I said, I've told you guys up there time after time after time, they have to fill out the form. That 72 hour window is that important that it gets turned in. 
Omnibudsman has said we can't get people to meet these requirements, we're going to start applying penalties. So know that that had to come out of his pocket. In that particular city, I know finance is here, the mayor <laughs> helped get it taken care of. But that was several years ago, so she's not around anymore. <laughs> but it, is, it does have to come out of that employee's pocket. Now, I don't know about any of you, but $6,000 for a garbage handler was a whole lot of money for him to have to come up with. But that's why it's important. If, you, if, if your people are not staying up on it, you've got to push these issues that I'm talking about because there are financial things not only to the county, but to the employee. What we've been told, and you're going to hear a little bit more, OSHA has, has applying some pressure on certain things, and this is one. Every time you go to the hospital on a worker's comp, the hospital has to do reporting to OSHA. If it's an injury, if it's a loss of limb, if it's an eye, if it's a death, if you don't follow the rules, they have to report it. This one doesn't have a fine to it yet, but we're being told that there's, not, there's going to be a short period of time where we, as the community or the county, are going to start being fined because we didn't force our employees to do the 72-hour rule. Somebody in your county needs to know what's in your policy and procedure manual if you have it. Don't bother having it if you're not going to use it. But unfortunately, if you have it, you better use it because if something happens to one of your employees and they get terminated, um, there are people who have a lot of reasons that we're going to love to use it against you. Um, and let me assure you, it happens every day. Um, make sure that, that your department heads one little key thing, and this is just because of experience. I guarantee you, many of your department heads are times they're counseling their employees, um, or your employee comes in having a bad day, or maybe their marriage is on the rocks. And so that supervisor thinks, you know, I've gone through marital counseling, or I had a divorce, or I had this and I had that. The moment they open their mouth and offer advice, the county is on the hook. They are not licensed counselors. My contention with all of you is to get an EAP program, an employee assistance program, that your department heads can say, hey, if you have financial issues, if you have drug issues, if you have marital issues, go seek these people out because that's where they can get help. But the moment your department head or even one of you start to counsel because we all want to help people, we all want to offer advice, don't, because if something goes wrong, you or that supervisor is the one that's going to be sued. And by that supervisor rep being a representative of the county, guess who else is going to be included in that lawsuit? So it's just, it's something that most people don't think of because we all want to help, we all want to offer ideas, but just know the moment you start playing counselor, there's a lawsuit waiting to happen. Because let me assure you, if I didn't learn anything else in law school, the one thing I did learn was no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> Again, be careful, when, have your department heads, be careful when they're given their opinion. Especially if it, if it moves into a legal or a financial they cannot provide, if, maybe if you have a 457 or you have um, PERF, don't allow your department heads to give their opinions on what they would do. Or, you know, I don't know what to invest in with, with my 457. 
the moment you or anybody else starts playing counselor, you've just become liable. And when they go bankrupt because you gave them a wrong tip, they're coming after you. A new thing that we just got, if, if all of you in here that do have manuals, I guarantee you if they're not within the last two years, you need to get a hold of this new military leave policy, uh, the, and it's now called ERISA. But this new leave policy for military is a whole lot wider and a whole lot broader and a whole lot better for our military people than it ever was before. Before we had to give the two weeks during the summer if they went to basic training um, and then a leave now it's they're f flexible to go to a six month training which we never had before uh, but with since desert storm way back when we have now opened up that there's a lot more leeway for your military people to go do different things that there weren't before and let me stress for you guys if they get that little piece of paper from the military that says the military wants them to go to here. Under the new ERISA, I don't care if you don't like it, I don't care if, if you don't agree with it, you better let them go. Because I don't know about you, but I don't want the US military mad at me. And after reading this, and it, used, it went from a, from a four paragraph statement on military leave, it is now four pages in most of the manuals that I've created throughout the state and the, and the federal code now is actually t two pages and if you've ever read federal code two pages in federal code is a lot of words so know that there's a lot there it does fit now more the National Guard because we send the National it, we talked about National Guard before but now it even goes more in depth with that because of National Guard being sent for real quick missions places. Now also, in case you didn't know, and my guess is, if you know this, it's only because you do what I do for a living. Three years ago in the state of Indiana, we passed an, in, an Indiana Military Family Act. The Indiana Military Family Act is, let's say I'm a service person. I'm in the service. I'm over in um, Afghanistan. My spouse is employed by your county. With this new leave, if there are things that she needs to get done because of my being, being gone that she cannot get to because she's working so hard for you guys five days a week that she can't get it done, the Indiana has passed a statute to allow that spouse to take time off from work up to a maximum of two weeks to, to get taken care of whatever necessary items are part of that. Or if they, and specific, then it specifically goes in, if you know that I'm coming home in a couple of weeks, from I'm being sent back to the states, that what it really goes into is two weeks for her to go get things at home ready for your return. Um, it's an, it's like I said, it was passed about three years ago. It slid under the radar. Nobody knew it. I was doing some digging for some new codes for this, and I accidentally ran across it. Um, but it, pardon? Yeah, 10 days. 10 days? Ten days? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sir, do you need to vote this? My appointment is coming up. Ten, ten, ten work days. days. Okay. Ten days. At the end of the appointment on the same calendar year for a total of 20 days? Yes. Okay. One was it's 10 days. It's within a 12-month period. Yeah, it is. It, like, not in my notes. Yeah, you're right. It says in the last line, 10 work days. Thank you. Um, 
And then the other one was at the beginning and at the end, in a 12 month period, you could have a total of 20 days. But my suggestion to each one of you is flexibility here. These are people whose spouses are on the front line. Flexibility. If they want a little more, allow them to have it. Um, now, the beauty is it doesn't have to be paid for, but it is something that's outside of, um, I know some counties, some municipal governments have in their PTO or their sick policy, they only give sick time. So you can't take a sick time for something like this. It would be some, it would be a reason in my book that you want to think about switching that sick time to a PTO, where they could, in fact, if they needed to take this issue, rather than making your employee lie and say, for the next 10 days, I'm going to be sick. Hey, we do it every day in municipal government. I guarantee you, if you went back and looked at your policy and procedure manuals, if you have sick days, you basically are telling your employees to lie. That the only way I can take this day is if I'm sick. Well, because I have written over 120 policy and procedure manuals in the state of Indiana for cities and towns. I, every time I read it, it says sick days. You get 10 of them, but only if the employee's sick. Now, let me tell you, how many of you in here would not take a sick day if your child was rushed to the hospital or your spouse was. Every time it's written like that, you are asking the people to lie and say, I'm going to take this sick day. So think about changing it to PTO. It frees it up, but it also helps your employees not to figure they have to lie. But I guarantee you, at least half of, of you in here, you're forcing your employees to lie about taking days off. Um, this is a policy, if you don't know, uh, it actually came out, the original policy came out four years ago, um, and actually just last November got changed again. Um, but in every place of business, where there's at least 75 employees, or if you're government, it doesn't matter what number that is, there is a lactation. You have to provide female employees with a private room that can be locked, that can be shut off from the public so there's no visible access to go express their milk. You are also required by the government to provide them with refrigeration. And it cannot be the lunchroom. You'd be surprised, you laugh, but you'd be surprised at how many people, I've had mayors go, Mitch, can we just put it in the break room in lunch? I said, no, specifically you can't do that. Well, we don't have a place to do it. So can we make them use the restroom? Specifically in the federal statute, there are two things that, the feds are pretty wishy-washy on most of what they do, but the two specific things is, it cannot be a bathroom, and it cannot be stored in the local, in your, the lunchroom refrigerator. Um, I did get, and this is actually going to be governed by OSHA, as of this past November, OSHA is gonna be the one watching this. And so I went to OSHA and I said, when you guys say refrigeration, what does that mean? Because I have some communities that are so small, just to go purchase a small refrigerator is, is an expense that most of them can't afford. And I got OSHA to at least agree that as long as we would provide a cooler that we had ice or some kind of refrigerant, that that would meet their standards. And, and even in the changes, they've loosened that up. In the original one, you had to, the person had to take time off from work that was unpaid. 
during the break time, if they took a break of 15, 20 minutes, whatever it was, to express milk, now that's been changed as of November that you have to allow that person to take it a break, a paid break, just like any other break. Sir? Um, so most counties, of course, have multiple buildings. Right. Well, I asked that question. Yes, a great. He asked if you have multiple buildings, do I have to do one or do I have to do all? I asked that very question because most of my cities and towns that I work with do have them. And the feds told me, out of, again, this is all coming from OSHA out of Washington, said, as long as you can say there is one location and those employees. Now, that means. That the, you're going to have to give a longer break time for that person, and they wanted to make that sure that was very clear. You do realize if you're only going to have one, you're still going, you're going to have a longer break. I said, I understand, but some of the places, uh, the, I know that Johnson County have a lactation room out at the county garage. <laughs> Even I couldn't go there, <laughs> so. We would have had one location in, in, the, in the building. The beauty is, is that if that person has, what the, what the feds have also said, is that if they have their own office and they can lock the door from the inside and close off any windows, that their own office is suitable also. So it's not like we have to go create something. I guarantee you there's a room that you probably have somewhere that could be closed off, that the door could be locked from the inside to take the process. Um, I even have one community is using, has cleaned out a closet. It's about a six by six closet, but they've put a, a nice recliner in there and electrical and a little table for that person in, in a small little closet. So it doesn't have to be much. Just know that OSHA, is going to use this as an opportunity for inspections. Yes, sir? Are you talking about OSHA or IOSH? Well, you know, it's, you understand it's both because OSHA is the federal. We only have IOSH. Well, um, that is Indiana OSHA. Yeah, Indiana Occupational Health and Safety. Well, but let me assure you, sir, the, the law comes from, Washington, from OSHA. We are, con actually, your manual, if you have one in your county, should say both. OSHA and IOSHA, because OSHA is big brother to Indiana Occupational Health. But there's no federal OSHA in Indiana. We have IOSHA. <laughs> sir, I used to be the head of HR for an airline. And let me assure you, it wasn't IOSHA that came and did my inspection. It was OSHA. For airlines and seaports, sea it was OSHA. <laughs> okay. I'm, thank you. No, they cannot, by statute, it cannot be near food products that somebody else could contaminate. The question was, if the employee wants to st store it in the employee break room refrigerator, could they? The answer to that is no. It cannot be near food products or other dairy products that could be contaminated. It has to be separate regardless of what the employee wants to do. Which is, exactly, which is why no bathroom. We don't want it contaminated. If the gentleman that thinks we're not under OSHA would read the reg, we are under IOSHA because OSHA allows us and can rescind that at any point in time. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I've only been doing right, this for... <laughs> Okay, whether it's IOSHA or OSHA, they have a new direction. And let me assure you, if this happens in your community, 
or your county, they are coming. They've put in place of workplace violence. We've had, and I've been selling and telling for the last few years, we've had a, out of Washington came out, the feds came out with a verbal harassment and a physical harassment that now goes into my EEO and discrimination. That's really what I do. And they've tied it in because the courts haven't really bought yet other than they know that this physical violence at work is starting to grow they have decided to allow OSHA to, or OSHA to take over control and if there is a workplace violence they will come in and do a full-blown investigation before that there really wasn't anybody watching to see what happened um, They've also been given, as of last November, control over LGBT. So if there is any complaints from you on, L on, on your employees and the LGBT, they will come in and do the investigations on your behalf. Let me assure you, you do not want these people in your buildings. Because the beauty with being able to now come into your buildings more is that if they see any violations at all, it opens up a full-blown investigation. And the more they get, are given control to come in and take over, it's going to create a problem. We don't have as much information on this yet. We're, we're waiting. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Because understand what the courts have said was they believe that it's that physical and verbal that has led to some of these issues. And to basically blanket statement that we do not allow for physical and we do not allow verbal. And we all in this room know that verbal goes on all the time. We all pick on each other. But, having lived through this, anybody remember Columbine? Friend of mine's son was literally in the cafeteria that day. And a boy walked up to him carrying all the guns that did the shooting in the cafeteria and said, you have never picked on me verbally or physically. Get out of here before I start doing something. And the kid told his mom, the moment that door shut behind me is when he started shooting. We have determined that it is the verbal and the physical that are causing people to do things that when most of us were kids was unheard of. So OSHA has said, our, our last president said, OSHA, you're going to take this over. Um, there's also coming out a Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. I know I have gone full circle in HR when we went in the 80s to having our health insurance cover pregnancies to our health insurance not covering pregnancies to having special time off for pregnancies to, have a, to not having to do it. We are full circle. We are back to now trying to prepare and take care of those mothers that are recently born. Had I not just had two daughters who've had granddaughters for me and watched what their companies did to them, I understand why we came back full circle because we're not taking care of them. OSHA has also been, believe it or not, put in charge of watching this. Um, Some things you need to watch on for years. Hiring concerns. Who's doing your hiring? Who's watching over it? Understand, even in Johnson County, when I was county commissioner, I had a planning department. Planning superintendent was doing interviewing. Three months later, we got a lawsuit for discriminatory hiring. 
all because the planning superintendent asked in the interview, when we do our planning commission meetings, it's up on a riser. Can you get your wheelchair up on the riser? We paid out to that person. All because we said, can you get that up here? Now, the sad part is, it was a fair and honest question because that person was going to be required to sit at those planning meetings up on that podium. But it wasn't up to us, her, to tell us. It was up to us to figure out how we were going to get her up there. And that's the key. So know what your people are doing the hiring and what they're asking. Have somebody be monitoring them. Workers' comp, we talked about that. Make sure that you have that taken care of. One of the biggest ways and expenses, I guarantee, in your county is if nobody is monitoring your workers' comp claims, your time off, what treatment do you have? Disciplinary issues, who's watching, who's controlling those? How are they, are they being followed by your, by your procedures and your processes in your manual? Have it detailed out, the steps. Make it easy for your people to follow. You do this, you do this, you do that, and then you terminate. It's that simple. One last thing that I want to tell you, we just, light duty. Anybody in here know if they have light duty in your counties? I'm going to strongly recommend you do away with light duty. And here's why. Effective January 1 of this year, there is a thing called ADA, the American Disabilities Act. Workers' comp injuries now come under ADA, which they never did before. Unfortunately, what ADA has come out and said was, if you provide light duty for an employee while they're either on a workers' comp injury or they're coming back from a medical, that you have created a permanent job for that employee. And if they, and let me assure you, I've worked with many of people throughout this state, if I can play the game and stay on light duty for the rest of my tenure working for you, I'm going to. And now that all they have to do is say, my doctor says I have to stay on this light duty, and let me assure you, if you don't think I can't get a doctor to write a statement like that, you haven't seen some of the statements from doctors that I've seen. But the doctor just has to state, this is now a condition he's never going to get away from or she's never going to get away from. You have literally created a permanent light duty job by having it. Keep them off until you get a return for work for 100% by that employee. Then you don't have to worry about re-injury liabilities with that. But most importantly, you don't have to worry about a a gentleman sitting in a chair counting paper clips. And I'm being serious because we have, throughout the state of Indiana, we have created some of the wildest light duty jobs because our workers' comp carrier has told us, we want to get those people back to save money. You're not saving money. Keep them off until they're 100%, then bring them back, get rid of your light duty if you have one. I saw a question back here. Well, I, I just had a, a comment and analogy. Uh, everything you're talking about is some of the things that got real complicated before we had specified warranties. Because before that, they were all implied warranties. And that could get you way down the road in deep trouble. And what you're saying is the more you specify in this manual exactly what you're going to do, the better off you'll be. You have a better defense, absolutely. If you, as long as you follow it. Yeah, don't be specific and, and create it that way if you don't plan to use it. Because I assure you, I will use it against you if you're not doing it. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, well, on the council portion, yeah, all counties have, most counties have 
community corrections and probation. A lot of these pieces aren't like people are not licensed counselors in corrections and are counseling people with drug problems. Where where do we stand on that? That's a good question. I honestly that's going on. I mean they're not uh, counseling these people. And, but but aren't they but in most of those programs I would hope that they have training. But they're not licensed as you put up there. There's a difference between There's no doubt. There's a difference between license, but there may be a, a difference because those are specifically trained particular for that very field. I will, I'm going to add that's I never thought of it from that perspective, but I will look into it. Anything else? Yep. It's the same program. You have to offer it to them, but my guess is, and the, I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> the, the situation is that most cases your retirees couldn't afford to pay your full premium anyway. Once they hit Medicare eligible, you're okay. But if they retire prior to being Medicare eligible, you do have to provide them with your package, but you can make them pay the full cost. Is that the counseling that you do for If you're telling me that whoever fill, helps fill out a W-4 form is also saying, because having sat there, I know firsthand what you're saying. Mitch, I don't know what I want. My only statement to them is, if you don't want any taxes taken out, claim zero. If you want you to have your money and not the government, claim as many as you can. But nothing more than that. Yes. I can't advise. That you, you, right. You just can't advise them that, you know, if I was sitting in your seat with five kids, I'd go ahead and claim three. It gets me in the middle. That's when I'm saying counseling, you're actually advising people what to do. And in the case of that form, I just say, hey, if you claim zero, I'm going to take the most taxes out of your paycheck. That means you'll get it back later next year. If you claim everybody, yeah, maybe that's true. Maybe. If you claim all the family members you have, I'm going to take less out. Uh, yes, I have a question on the pregnancy uh, workers. Does that include the father? Does he get pregnancy leave also? Because some companies are doing that now. Good question. It does not fall. It falls under FMLA. Again, this is not FMLA. This is a new pregnancy. So I can, under FMLA, take up to 12 weeks as the father. Uh, that's why I don't understand why we're creating this, because FMLA already covers up to 12 weeks on both sides. Um, and that's why we're, we're still waiting on exactly what they're going to come out new and say, this is what we're going to do. But the pregnancy specifically is being written for women and their protection. Anything else? Well, thank you very much for your time this morning. <laughs>